you know, thanks, thanks, John, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, second of these two webinars that we're presenting on the Wiener Book. Um, I'd uh, like to emphasise right at the beginning, and uh, if I go to this next screen, we talk about the Wiener Book. The, the presentation today is about the Wiener Book, um, and uh, obviously it was um, initiated by MLA, but uh, they contracted a group of us, um, extension staff principally from Queensland, uh, Northern Territory and Western Australia to work on uh, putting the book together um, for Northern Australia. The, the aim of our contract, the aim of the, of the book is to put together or put into one publication all the information that's around on weaning and weaning management in Northern Australia. So there, as we all know there's a lot in publications but these tend to be one topic publications, one part of weaning or weaner management. There's a lot of experience out there with producers and also with, um, with department staff and so we tried to gather all that to put into this publication. As you may imagine, from having the, the, the charter of doing all of Northern Australia, which is such a, a, a pretty diverse area, um, there was uh, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, differences. You know, we go from the, um, you know, the good country, say, the big low country in central Queensland to some fairly poor country further north and west. And so, and then down into the... Uh, the, the almost unique area of the Alice Springs area. So we had a fair job to do. So what I'd like to emphasise is that, that what this was that was our, char, our our job. It wasn't. We're not reporting today on a new research project where we've come up with some brilliant new ideas on how to how to manage weaning or weaner management. We started off um, obviously with the with the question of why wean, and in many of our publications, this is an area that that we thought had been neglected. We talk a lot about the calf once it's been weaned and uh, how to manage it, how to feed it, etc. Um, but uh, one of the really important things is about the cow, obviously, and we have a, have a reasonable section there talking about the reason why we wean and as we've said there on the screen that uh, we, the aim would be to keep a cow in about conditions for three, three and a half at calving. We can aim to do that, then she's got a better chance of going back to calf, that sort of thing. Obviously, the benefits of of doing that is that by taking the calf off the cow, uh, we have our nutritional requirements. Therefore, we, re we improve conception rates and, and lack, uh, particularly conception rates during lactation. And the big one for many areas is, is that reduction in mortality. This is obviously what we want to avoid. We don't don't want to see this sort of thing, A, from a property management point of view and also from a welfare point of view. The next question, I guess, is um, when to wean. If we work out why we want to wean, then when do we wean? And again, with the, with the vast range in management that we have across, across the northern Australia, um, we looked at control motor herds and uncontrolled mated herds. And in the controlled mated herds, we think that you need to get the calves off the cow at the end of the wet season, somewhere in that May to uh, March to May period. And with the aim of trying to get the calf off the cow about a month before the pasture quality really starts to decline so that she's got, got time to freshen up and, and hopefully put on a bit of condition. In the um, continuously mated herds, for the first round muster, if there's two musters done in a year, then for that first round muster, very similar to what we what we said for control motor herds. But for the second round muster, it's obviously happened sometime in that second half of the of the um, of the dry season, most probably September, October. The aim is to reduce the weight loss in cows because that's getting, as we all know, it's getting into the tougher time of the um, of the dry season with the aim of increasing early conception when the season breaks. So it's probably not going to get a lot of conception until the season breaks and increase those early conceptions when the season breaks at the, at the great achievement. Going on from there, then, the question then becomes, what do, what do you mean? What, what sort of calves, what size? In the control motor herds, we think that all calves 
should be weaned at that at that first mining. But if you have a if the control mining is for say five or six months, there may be a need to have two weaning. But the important thing there would be that that second weaning wasn't left too late, uh, and the cows got down in condition. In the continuously mated herd, um, possibly down to about 100 kilos at both months would be the aim. And obviously in, in drought years, then you may want to wean earlier again and, and lighter and maybe get down to, down to about 50 kilos. Just getting on to the particularly managing the cow, that I think it, if we can picture this, that that taking the calf off the cow is similar to giving her a, a supplement of, of two kilos of grain or three kilos of molasses a day. You can get a bit of a picture of the benefit that she's going to get out of that. That's the sort of supplement we talk about feeding cows in a bad drought. Then the benefit of that is that with a weaned cow, we possibly delay the start of any supplementation. The urea-based protein supplements are usually sufficient and <coughs> many animals if weaned early enough and in good enough condition, may not need any supplement at all. And uh, obviously we're change, taking the focus off supplementing the cow and putting it onto the, onto the weaner. Just some points there that uh, most probably are, are obvious, but we need re reiterating that if a cow's going to have a calf every 12 months, then she needs to conceive within 75 days of calving. And that's why we go back to that first slide and say, well, you know, if she's got to be in say, conditions for three, three and a half or better at calving because in 75 days um, he's not going to have a lot of time to put on a lot of conditions. Obviously to do this, uh, to carve every uh, every 12 months he's got to conceive, conceive while lactating. The important thing to think about is that um, if, if weaning is... Um, practice is, is leaving calves on cows a bit, a bit too long now and it's going to change that the improvements in reproductive performance and reproductive rate will accumulate over time. They won't happen overnight but if it, that practice is continued for a number of years then you'll see that, um, that improvement accumulate. Just getting on to the calf now and as I said this is where the emphasis has been for a lot of times in a lot of our publications and obviously it's, uh, it's essential that that this is a, an area that uh, <coughs> receives a lot of attention. Obviously the calf, once it's weaned, must be fed and managed well, depending on what your target is, where you want it to, where it to go, but you need to have some plan in mind. One of the really important things is that the calves have, have good quality hay in the, in the hay racks as soon as they're put in the weaner yard, not the day after or the day after that. If, if they're left to go hungry for or have really poor quality hay for in that first period, it starts to affect the function of the rumen, which we'll talk about in a minute, and it uh, can have, a, have an effect on their performance later in life. It's also important where you're weaning particularly younger calves that they're drafted, they're weighed and drafted into groups for targeting the uh, particular management and feeding requirements of that group. Um, the other thing is that uh, calves under 150 kilos live weight, we believe, must gain some weight. Over that weight, maybe we could say, you know, we could manage our weaners if, if they maintain weight, that could be okay. But certainly under 150 kilos, we'd like to see them gaining some weight. The big thing that we must remember, with, particularly with these calves, and, with the, and the smaller they get, the more, the more important it is, and that is the welfare of those calves and that if they're not managed well and fed well, that welfare can be an issue and that is a, um, we no need to tell, it, tell people what the problems that that can bring if we have a, have a poor welfare system. Just uh, re-emphasising that need there that, you know, you can see there we've got a photo of some calves that have been drafted according to weight so that group can be managed, uh, targeted particularly at that weight group. When we... Um, just getting on to the nutrition now, and there's often a question about the uh, development of the, uh, particularly the rumen, of the whole digestive system in a calf. Because up until weaning, as we know, a majority of it, um, its nutrient comes from milk, and therefore we only need, you know, the abomasum down here is the, is the organ that, that's uh, functioning really well, and the rest of it has to develop 
as the calf grows. And we can see in this diagram here that that the uh, the newborn calf has a relatively small rumen compared to the size of the other mason down here. But at 10 weeks old, relative to that other drawing, the rumen is, is much larger. And so we can see that that's how that how it will develop. But as we've said there, um, the rumen still needs to develop. And that was one of the important, what I was saying before the um, making sure there's good quality hay in the racks when the, calf goes, the calves go in there because this room is developing the micro microorganisms that are in there but they still need to increase and any setback then will affect the development there. Talking about the pasture side uh, we believe that um, <coughs> wiener paddocks need to be spelled over the wet season it's really important to do that and if you're may, having two weanings that you have a second uh, a second paddock for those second round wieners and they don't go back into the same paddock as the, as the first round wieners went into because that's most probably going to be eaten out. The quality of feed in there is going to be poor. The one thing that we, we'd like to emphasise and we've made it there quite bold is that the um, to never to use the wiener paddock as a spare paddock for other stock and often the wiener paddocks are close to the yard so we're spelling them, but you know, there's always a few cattle, <coughs> a few cows, a few bulls, a couple of horses, or something like that that need to um, that that need to be kept somewhere. And we put them in the wiener paddock, and then we end up at the end of the season with the wiener paddock that's eaten out, even though we thought we spelled it. The question always is, how do we feed wieners? How well do we feed them? What do they get fed? And this will vary according to what you want them to do. What's your target market for them? What quality is the pasture in the um, in the paddocks they're going to go out into? And we suggest that you use an, an NIRS to know exactly what's there rather than trying to estimate it. Also, from the target market, um, you can work out the level of the level of growth required from from weaning to your to your target, and therefore work out those levels of growth. Then you can know what nutrition. Is. We would make a point though, that we believe that particularly for calves under 150 kilos, if they're going to gain more than 0.1 of a kilo a day, which isn't very much as you all know, then they need some high energy and uh, high protein diet. And that usually comes in the form of, of wiener pellets or wiener mix or something like that. Maybe a protein meal. The other thing to consider, and this is if we go to almost the other extreme, is if we really push our wieners along and get really good weight gain out of them, are we going to run into a problem with compensatory growth in that once they go out in the paddock, um, then they're not going to, once they go off the supplement, should I say, then they're not going to perform quite as well as they might have otherwise. One of the things that uh, we often see, and I know, I, I suppose it happens most, over most of uh, Queensland, if not the rest of northern Australia, is we have a term called wiener hay, and I think it's just code for poor quality hay, but uh, calling it wiener hay is better. Or sounds better. And uh, the question we pose there with those photos is can the calf eat enough of the hay that it's offered? And on the right is what we believe is uh, what, a, what a wiener, a 100 kilo wiener would actually eat or voluntarily eat. And on the left is what it would need to eat, gain 0.5 of a kilo a day. And you can see there that it's just absolutely impossible. So if you're going to get up particularly into those higher weight gains, then uh, some really good quality feed is needed. The book also has in it in the appendix area some um, what we term handy calculations, um, things like how to work out the uh, dry matter percentage, dry matter in a feed, um, work out the cost the cost per kilo of of that dry matter, determine the cost per kilo of a particular nutrient. So if you're buying a feed for its protein content, well, the uh, calculation here allows you to say, well, what's, by buying this feed, what's a kilo of protein going to cost me? Also, um, a simple one of how to convert dollars per tonne to cents per kilo, and there are a number of others. We've just got to just put a thumbnail sketch of them in there. One of the important things, obviously, when managing wieners is managing uh, their, their health and uh, 
one of the things that we believe and we you know we sort of found during our, our uh, search for information that is that there seems to be <coughs> not enough emphasis or not enough uh, recognition of the stress of weaning. And we've got a list of a whole lot of things down there on the on the left hand side of that little table, if you call it that, that will cause stress. And the stress reduces the um, the calves' uh, ability to fight off any uh, any infection, and therefore we end up with problems. And one of the important things we find there, um, we can have a problem with with internal parasites, particularly and maybe external. Um, we have a, a bigger problem, I believe. One of the biggest internal parasite problems is coccidiosis. Um, as I've said there, it's uh, <coughs> initiated by stress of weaning, and uh, it can, the, uh, the effect of it can be reduced by good, good nutrition and good management. Uh, what's not said there, but is uh, sort of well known, is that we would recommend that any supplement fed to weaners, particularly those under a, under 100 and, uh, and 50 kilos, uh, would need a, a coccidiostat in it. And any of the proprietary mixes you get tend to have it in these days, so that's, that's very good. The problem with coccidiosis, as, as anyone who's experienced it knows, is that it often doesn't show up to four to six weeks following weaning, by which time the problems, the, the uh, the parasite has done its damage, and you're only then treating the treating the symptoms. Um, so, as I said there on the bottom, we believe all supplements should have a coccidia stat in them. Obviously, um, training the weaner is is uh, essential um, for handling the car, making the animal ha easier to handle later in life. Obviously, there's a variety of uh, weaning programs across the north and varying between from one property to another. But they're all aimed at making the weaners easier to handle. Um, there's enough evidence around to show that calves that are, that are weaned and, and uh, managed well and, and handled well after weaning uh, do better um, and perform better later in life. It also, uh, as you well know, provides a safer working environment for both the cattle and the, and the people. Uh, is there any questions? So yep. the questions regarding the, the body condition score, which of course we know is a one to five scale, where um, low, yeah, one is poor and five is fat. The question is, Russ, um, why the three point five score instead of three? Is this because you're assuming that she'll lose another point five? Well, it it could be. I mean, it it it, it does tend to, I suppose. To, to, to a degree, be splitting hairs a bit. We could say three and justify that, um, but we're not saying two. You know, yes, if, if they're three, three, three point five, uh, or better. You know, if, if you can get them into three, fair enough. Um, if you can get them to three point five, it's even better. But I mean, I yes, think it's um, yeah, that's about where I think um, where we're at. So, that so, one. So, yeah. so you're saying no, don't want it any lower than so if you can have it. Yeah. About The thing is, in a in a mob, um, you're always going to get some variation. If you if you aim for the average of three, it's going to be cows much lo you know a bit lower. If you aim for three and a half, well, then you've got that bit of leeway back for the um, the ones below the the target average. The next question, Russ, is: Is there uh, any other reason for never having sundry stock in a paddock, or was it just so that it's always the precious pasture? Well, the, the most important thing is that um, is to have the good pasture. That's the really important thing about it. I suppose the secondary reason for that is that if you happen to have adult cattle in there that um, that did have a worm burden or a, or a parasite burden, I should say, rather than just a worm burden, but a parasite burden, be they internal or external, particularly say for external, say sick, then you could be uh, seeding up your paddock with um, parasites of one kind or another, you put your weaners in there, and then they attack the weaners because the we you know the, the the few parasites that are on a on a cow that a cow can deal with may be a problem will will most probably present a problem for um for the weaners. So you could put cattle in there and say, oh, they're all right, you know, they you know they got a few tick on them, but they're not a worry. That sort of you know that that population 
respond to a wean, it could cause problems, particularly a little wean. Uh, yeah, there is another, and I'll, the main reason is though that that, they, that they've got good feed. Um, just another couple of questions. So yep. this one uh, regarding uh, feed. So what are the better choices of hay for a higher protein content? Um, okay, I think we we have made the point in the book that um, where it's available, and I know down here where I live, it's, it's uh, readily available is, is, is loose and hay. Now, often we get the feeling if we've got these little weaners, we want to give them the best hay they can get, and so we buy pretty good loose and hay to give to them. Um, really, that's not the best thing to do because there's a, a lot of experience suggests that good quality loose and hay will cause calves to fear. <coughs> so mm. we're looking for a good quality, um, well, if down this way, if you could get what we term grass illusion or a good uh, grass hay that's been cut at the right time or some other legume hay that's been cut at the right time so it's maximum nutrient, that's adequate. <coughs> Excuse me. But as I just say, we don't, you know, while, while that loose and hay nutritionally reads terrific, if, if we do have those problems with the calves, with the calf scaring. So, Good, good, good quality grass hay, but the problem with getting good quality grass hay at times is, I know down here, um, people often often leave the leave the grass until it seeds, and then they head the seeds, and they take something like rose grass, they'll take the seed off, and then they'll make hay out of it. Well, obviously that's poor quality. I mean, one of the other things that, that I hadn't mentioned, I just realised I hadn't mentioned, was some of your, your winter cereals, if you can get, get good quality oats or barley or something like that. But again, that needs to be made uh, made before it goes to head very much. Otherwise, you don't, um, you know, the quality is going to drop off dramatically, and so you end up with straw. Because I know one of the things that when uh, I was on, the, I worked on the down some years ago, and people used to get barley hay and look for grain in it, and thought it was good hay because it had grain in it. But once it formed grain, then the the rest of the quality of the rest of the plant is very poor. So I suggest you, you know, the hay needs to be made um, before the seed matures at least. So there's a lot of range there, but it, it's really important that you, that you get that better quality and maybe not just the run of the mill that may be readily available. How long from when the calves first go into the wiener yard do you recommend to start working them through the yard? Oh, this varies. I mean, if you talk to... To 10 producers, you most probably get 10, 10 different answers and they're all right. Um, I would think that they need a couple of days to settle down to get it to, um, you know, forget, or not completely forget mum, but, you know, get over that initial shock of weaning and that sort of thing. Uh, certainly by the by the end of the end of a week I'd be putting them through and I'd most probably, be, if they'd settle down, well, I'd be looking to put them through, work them through the yards at least, you know, after four, four or five days, but it'll all depend on 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 different um, how, how cattle are handled. And as I say, everyone most probably got a different opinion on it. It's the same as um, if you, I thought the question was going to be how long do you leave them in the yard, and, and you talk to different people. And some people only have them in there a week, and they've got well handled cattle. Other people might have them in there for three weeks, and they've got equally as well handled cattle. So it really depends on your program and your experience and that sort of thing. Talking about the pasture, and obviously pasture management is important. Um, then um, it's all, it, we go through the same things as as uh, we talk about whether we're managing weaners or, or adult cattle or whatever. But we need to match the stocking rate to the feed available. And uh, I realise I've got a typo there. Um, and uh, so <coughs> obviously, if if the, if the calf isn't getting uh, good nutrition, then it's not going to perform to its potential and if we can manage the pastures to uh, increase the uh, the number of 3P grasses, you know the old story we talk about every time we talk about managing pastures, then we're better off. If we've got um, a good pasture then we, because of our weaner management we can get a higher reproductive rate, then there's a potential to run fewer breeders for the same number of weaners and by, if we're able to do that then we can lower stocking rates, which improves pasture condition, which improves cow condition, which again 
is one of those, those cumulative benefits that we see over time from from just from introducing some, some better weaning management practices, etc. One of the big questions that we were was put to us as a as a project group putting this book together is we really want to have something about the economic impact. And the more we worked on this question, the, the, the harder we we found it to, to, to be to answer because it really depends on the level of management of the property at the time. If you had a property where the weaning management was, was really poor and it was more of a, just a drafting out sale cattle or something like that, the benefits of introducing a weaner management program um, are most probably quite high. Whereas if you've got a reasonably good ma weaner management program now and it's just going to be uh, tweaked a little bit to improve, uh, improve things, then the benefits aren't going to be quite as high. So I think, as we've said there, that um, it needs to be determined on an individual basis. And one of the things that we'll notice in a slide later on when we're talking about a project that, that we've reported on in here is that introducing uh, good weaner and weaner weaning and weaner management has spin-offs and there's a whole lot of other things that happen on the place and and so you know the whole place runs better and, and that's what needs to be taken into account when doing any economic impact. Just um, some figures that are, are to this slide pretty much to demonstrate some of the uh, information that's in the, in the book and when we're talking about growing replacement heifers, um, if, we, if we get them off the cow and we can manage them as a separate group they're well handled, then there's a, the, the benefits are that we're going to have a, a more calves, more heifers at a, at a target weight to select from when you're selecting your, your heifers to go into mating. Also, the heifers will be, be heavier, the, the cull heifers will be heavier than those that are culled before or after mating. And in areas that, that will support it, there's a greater opportunity for yearling joining. In the table there, and I don't want to go right through it all, it's there as an example, but what was calculated there is that if a calf was weaned at 100 kilos on the 1st of May and we wanted it to be 300 kilos um, to mate, then if we wanted to mate it as a yearling, then it would have to gain 0.9 of a kilo a day or 0.94, and if we were going to mate it as a two-year-old, it would need to gain 0.34. I think this is one of the important things. We've done a couple of these tables through the book so that people can, can make a calculation using that or do their own calculation so that we can, you can actually say, well, you know, this is, this is how these heifers have got to grow. So you've got a, a, a target for them. You can check it at times along the road whether they're on target or not. Getting down into the benefits, what we believe are the benefits of good weaning practice, we've covered a number of these already through the, through the presentation that the better, better breeder condition obviously lead to higher reproduction, lower mortalities, which is uh, an issue on many properties, a lower supplement cost because of the lower mortalities, etc., and you've got more females to sell. And one of the benefits that we often, we've often heard of um, from properties that, that start a good weaner management program is that their, their carving becomes more concentrated. On the weaner side of it, you know, you've got a generally a quieter, uh, well-handled cattle that, are, that, that have been weaned if they've been trained well after weaning. And therefore, if you're, particularly if you're a, a, a store producer, then you know, your cattle get a good reputation, uh, which is required. Some of the, um, it's not all, all benefits, obviously, and uh, if you're going from scratch and starting a, an intensive weaner, weaning and weaner management program, there's some costs involved and the things like the infrastructure you need to, to handle weaners and obviously these will uh, vary from one property to another uh, depending on the number of weaners you're looking to handle. And so there may be some extra yards needed to be fencing, could be fencing for weaner paddocks and to be able to segregate weaners. Uh, purchase of feeding equipment may be loaders, feed bins, troughs and feed storage. Also the um, the supplements, and as I said earlier, we were talking about the uh, the need for calves to, 
to uh, under 150 kilos to have a high quality supplement if they are to gain uh, anything above about 0.1 of a kilo a day and those supplements can be quite expensive so there's a, there's a cost in there and there's also extra labour cost in managing those women so there's those things to think about when um, if, you ever, if you're doing an economic analysis of, uh, of a wiener management. I said at the beginning that we didn't um, set out to do a project as a, as a research project, but in the um, part of our investigations and searching for information to include in the book, we, uh, we found that we were made aware of this uh, project that was run on Flora Valley in the East Kimberley by Steve Petty, and uh, obviously at the Heights people. Highsbury property. Um, the property runs something like 10,500 breeders and they introduced this uh, early weaning uh, trial and the results of that trial were then compared back to a similar property that, that the company hadn't, um, hadn't introduced early weaning on. So how they ran that was that at the first round Muster was in, Mar in the March to June period and at that muster all calves heavier than 60 kilos were weaned and drafted and they were drafted into those over 150 and those under and as it, the slides are there, those uh, under 150 got a high, high quality ration. The important, one of the important things about, about this project and I think this is one of the things that uh, uh, where we, we talk about weaner management programs but then the spin-offs from it and there was extra management imposed and this was where the breeders were drafted on a, a, as either wet or dry at this first muster and then the dry cows were preg tested and then they were drafted in those three groups that, I, that I've got there. And that was the calves, the cows that they, th they thought would calve before the second round muster which was about in September, October those are the calve after the second muster and the non-pregnant. And the non-pregnants were culled and those that had calved before the second round muster and the wet cows were put together and they were the only cattle that were mustered for the second round because they're the only ones that had, um, had calves that, that, would, uh, that, that needed to be weaned. And I think that's a really important part of this project. It wasn't just that calves were weaned down to 60 kilos, there was this extra um, management imposed on the breeders which, which saved a lot of cost in uh, muster later in the year. As I said in a slide a little while ago, um, the majority of the, the cost for this project occurred in the first year in the setting up of the trial, in the feeding, you know, putting in the feeding facilities in the yard, the fencing for the, um, for the supplementation and segregation. The water supply, where they um, they medicated their, their waters on uh, Flora Valley, so they had to have, have extra water uh, medicators for that, and the feeding and storage and feed out equipment and all that. Some of the um, the outcomes of that project were that um, the conception rate or the branding rate increased from about 70 percent to about 80 84 percent. As I said in one of those earlier slides, they they uh, had a better synchronised calving, it was more concentrated. Over time there were fewer what they termed early weaners, but those, those lower, lower weight weaners. Feeding, a lower feeding cost because there were fewer of those smaller calves. A lower mustering cost, particularly in that second round where they uh, only had to muster the cows, the, wet, the cows that were wet and those that would calve to the calve before the second round muster. And uh, as I've pointed out there in, in, the re, in Steve's report on this, he, he attributes about half of the benefit, the overall benefit, to the improved weaning management and half to just a, a flow-on effect of overall better management on the property. And that's things like we said about that drafting breeders according to the, when they were going to carve and things like that. That's um, a, the end of, of the... Um, of the part about what's in the book, and uh, I hope you've sort of uh, whetted your appetite for those who haven't read it to uh, to go and get to get a book. And, I'll, and later on, I'll, I'll give you an, a a place where you can, I'll show you where you can go to get a book. In doing this, running this project and compiling this book, we 
became aware of, of a number of issues that we believe are a problem in the industry that uh, that maybe need to be addressed. And the, the one that thing is that, that we believe that weaners must be weighed because there's a problem of not realising the number of calves that are under 150 kilos and therefore need some uh, better management. And, uh, you know, they, we can estimate what weight these calves are and things like that, but if we can weigh them, they draft it properly and then they can be uh, uh, managed according to those weights and their, their particular requirements. The other one is, is the recognition of the stress of weaning, and, and we outlined these in that health slide earlier on, but just the weaning process itself, and on some properties, particularly on the, on the uh, more extensive, larger scale properties, uh, calves are weaned, uh, and then they're transported to a growing property fairly soon after weaning. They might be branded on the, on the, weaning, on the property that they're weaned on, and then they're trucked away to a, to a growing property. Um, so that, that again causes stress and, and in, the, in many cases, um, I picked on the bigger properties again, calves aren't, aren't branded uh, or any you know, processed at all until, until weaning and so you've got that on top of it again. So there's a whole lot of stress involved there which lowers the calves' immune system and uh, therefore you end up with diseases and particularly that cost of the ocean. So I think that's something that that everyone needs to be aware of. Um, also, the recognition of the nutritional requirements for a particular growth rate. How much, what, what, what growth have they got to make and what nutritional level do they need to get to, get to, that, to, to achieve that? We've also we've talked there about the health and welfare issues. We've highlighted that a couple of times through the presentation. Um, the other one is about not having a designated weaner paddock or paddocks and and therefore those paddocks aren't getting spelled and so we're just using a paddock that's already there that we may have already used throughout the year. One of the things that from that and from what we found out about the um, found out during our, our project and our compilation of this book is some of the things that we we'd like to look at and, and some of these have, have supported work from other projects where we can see a need for more work is to measure the impact of the rate of gain from weaning to slaughter on carcass characteristics. There have been projects done on this, but not on a range of, with a, with a group of calves of a range of weight at a range of growth rates. Um, also to establish minimum growth targets to optimise future productivity for a range, for a range of markets, including the live export. Uh, what weight gain do we need? What's the target? Similar to what we had there for that um, for that uh, heifer growth to uh, to mating weight. One of the other things we we think needs to be uh, to be demonstrated is the is the value of of NIRS and and that's that that uh, analysis of dung to uh, give an estimate of the diet quality of that the calves are eating. Um, on, on just on what quality that the feed is, and then using that to determine their supplement requirements to reach to reach their growth target. So there's a couple of things there that we think need to be uh, to be looked at. If you um, if you would like to get a copy of the book, I'll leave that slide up there for a short while so that you can uh, you can copy that down if you want to. And uh, while we while I'm doing that, John, I think I'm I'm up to. Uh, more questions if there are any. And indeed there are. We've got a couple of questions here for you, right? So what is the youngest age a winner should be weaned? Well, I suppose the, the question is it should be weaned or could be weaned. I mean, it would be lovely um, to not have to wean anything, say, under 200 kilos and get a high conception rate. But on many, you know, many properties, particularly you know, the, the properties on, on poorer fertility country, um, that's not possible. So, as I said there in a slide quite early on, um, in a drought time we might wean down to 60 kilos and provided those calves are, are fed and managed well, they'll do all right. So, but again, that is really intensive and they, those calves need very intense management 
and very good, very good management. So it's not something we recommend is done as a, as a general routine, but some people may want to do it. You can see that high speed project. They weaned down to 60 kilos at their, at their first round, and they believe that, that they, they, uh, they can handle them, and that's given benefits to the whole property. But certainly we would think um, on, on, country, on, on poor fertility country where cow condition, um, female mortality is a problem and, and also um, conception rates, branding rates are a problem, then the aim is most probably to wean down to 100 kilos, uh, at, even if it's, two, if it's two rounds of mustering a year, 100 kilos at both, at both musters. And the last question for the moment is, in the case of calves that have missed branding and are now in the weaner yard, when do you recommend to mark? Well, that, that was, interestingly enough, that was a, a topic that was debated um, within the group uh, when, we were, when we were putting the book together. Because in one of our um, case studies, one of the producers thought uh, that, that it, well, so I start that again. The general recommendation would have been to say do them and get them out of, you know, the day you put them out of the yard. So you haven't got calves with, particularly the, the male calves that have just been castrated lying around in a, in a cattle yard with, an, with a fresh open wound. And, and for cattle that have been dehorned, the same thing. The one, the, the, the reason that there was a bit of debate within the group was that one of the producers who did, a, did the, um, did the uh, case study for us said, no, he prefers to do them prior to, you know, a couple of days before letting them out so that you can, um, so that when they leave the yard, the last thing they, they remember is, you know, it's all nice rather than the last thing they remember about the yard was they went through the branding cradle and they got, you know, got some castrated, branded, dehorned and things like that. But I think generally if, if, it's, if, it's, if you've got weaners that haven't been, uh, been branded, then do them and, and let them out of the yard. But then that doesn't mean let them out, you know, they go back, in, go back bush because as you see right through our presentation, there's been a recommendation you have a wean, have weaner paddocks where, they, where, they, where you keep a close eye on them. They're still being tailed out, things like that, being looked after. So generally I think the, the uh, consensus would be to do them the day you let them out or as soon as possible or as close as possible to when you let them out. There are uh, a couple of you know, cases where people think it's, it's advisable to do them a bit earlier. Thanks, Russ. So I think we'll all questions there because we're coming towards the end of our time. I think, Russ, on the next slide, you've got your contact details. So do you want to pop yeah. that up? What I'd, um, I'd suggest there that because this book is aimed at Northern Australia, that um, there's going to be things that are unique to different different areas, and or should I say, or most probably specific to different areas. So. If anyone wants to wants more information about this, I'd suggest they contact their local beef extension officer in the first place. Um, but if they can't, then they're welcome to contact me. And what I would do then is, if I can't answer the question, then I'll I'll divert that to one of the team members from the appropriate team member from that that particular area of Northern Australia. Thanks, Russ. And uh, since you mentioned the word team, it reminds me that the publication of this book has been a team effort. So I'd just like to acknowledge the other authors, many of which are with us today. So uh, joining Russ with the um, pleasure of putting this publication together were Bernie English, Mick Sullivan, Desiree Jackson, Rebecca Matthews and Bill Holmes, all from the Queensland Government. And then there's Neil MacDonald, Peter Oxley and Sally Ligo from Northern Territory and Peter Smith from Western Australia. Um, and also thanks to Ian Partridge who did a lot of the editorial work there. So thanks team for getting the book together and it's great that it's now available. But Russ, I'd really like to thank you for well, giving up your lunchtime today um, and helping us to better understand wiener management. So thank you.
Um, and thanks to all those who joined us today for the webinar. We um, have enjoyed having you along and asking all those really good questions. And um, I wish you all the best and um, have a good weekend.